Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, from the first chapter. Listen to God's word. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly, to, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense, when Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink, even before his birth. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me, and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. The word of the Lord. Thank you to our readers. Uh, throughout the season of Advent, we're going to be going through all of chapter one of Luke's gospel. And so we began today, and we appreciate there are long blocks of scripture, and it's great to have uh, multiple readers to help us engage these stories. Would you join with me in prayer? Now, Lord, grant that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The story is told of a young, inexperienced pastor who is making hospital calls one day. He comes to the bedside of an aging man in the congregation. The man is not in good shape. He's, he's in his mid-90s, and the pastor is thinking maybe his time has come. There are tubes and IVs, oxygen masks. The young pastor introduces himself and asks if, if there's anything he can do for the man, and the man replies, pray for me to be healed. 
Well, okay, replies the young pastor. We can do that. He, he takes the man's hand and he prays, O oh Lord, we pray for healing for our brother. But if it not be your will, help us trust in your presence to sustain us and remind us that healing comes in many forms, even as we hope for the life everlasting that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. As the pastor opens his eyes, he sees a brightness on the man's face that was not there before. And the man begins smiling, sits up in the bed and starts pulling off the oxygen tubes and disconnecting the IVs. He sits up on the side of his bed and stretches out his arms and he, he hops down and he exclaims with a joyful shout, I'm healed. And he runs out of the room and goes skipping down the hallway. Meanwhile, the young pastor makes his way to the stairwell, sleeks out of the hospital, and as he gets back to his car, says, I wasn't expecting that. I wonder if pastors sometimes aren't expecting what should be hoped for. I wonder if Zechariah was expecting God to actually show up in the Holy of Holies that day? Was he expecting Gabriel to say to him, your prayer has been heard, Zechariah? This comes on the heels of Gabriel's miraculous appearance, which leaves poor old Zechariah terrified. He was a, a small town priest. His father was a priest, as was his father before him, all the way back to Abijah, one of the 24 sons of Aaron, who founded 24 different orders of priests, kind of like Jesuits and Vincentians and Dominicans, only they were Jewish and they could get married. Zechariah was married to Elizabeth. She also was a preacher's kid, a descendant of Aaron. They were good people, salt of the earth, or as Luke put it, righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. Unfortunately, it appeared that this particular branch of the priestly line would end because Zechariah and Elizabeth had no children. In that small town, people would have assumed that this was the result of some moral failing on their part, that some deep, dark sin left them childless. But Luke wants us to be sure, that, or wants to make sure that we know this is not true. Elizabeth and Zechariah are good people. They simply hadn't been able to have children. And given all the people of the Hebrew Bible for whom this was true, Abraham and Sarah, Jacob and Rachel, Elkanah and Hannah, as we heard in our Old Testament reading today. Well, Zechariah and Elizabeth are in pretty good company. As they were getting on in years, they no doubt resigned themselves to the reality that this branch of Abijah would end with them. Now, as was the case every year, the time for Zechariah's order of priests to serve in the temple rolled around for two weeks each year he and his 350 brothers in the order of Abijah would handle the priestly duties there in the temple in the big city of Jerusalem it was a really big deal all the vestments the finery the processionals Zechariah no doubt looked forward to it now as part of the tradition one year each year one priest would be chosen by lot to offer the incense in the heart of the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, where God was thought to dwell. This was a very big deal. A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for whoever's lot was drawn. Now, as I understand it, they would tie a rope around the person who went into the Holy of Holies in case they dropped dead in the presence of God and they had to drag the body out it was known to happen, two of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, they once made an unholy incense offering and fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them 
It's in Leviticus 10. Zechariah had no doubt read that story. Nonetheless, it's quite an honor to be chosen. Again, a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And that day it happened. Zechariah was chosen. Some combination of excitement and shock, perhaps some trepidation, if not terror, no doubt came upon him. It is the presence of God, after all. He was going in. What was he thinking as they tied that rope around his waist? What went through his mind as they they handed him that censer and the fire to make the incense offering? What was the prayer on his heart as the congregation was praying throughout the inner court of the temple? Was he praying for a clean heart so that he wouldn't wind up like Nadab and Abihu? Was he praying for himself? Or was his prayer more public for world peace or for Judea to be freed from the tyranny of Rome, from the brutality of 40 years of Herod's rule? Or deep in his heart was he thinking, as honored as I am today, I'd trade it all in an instant if Elizabeth could have a baby. What was Zechariah's prayer that day? Now the people who are surrounding the Holy of Holies, they were offering a prayer that we know, thanks to Jeremiah's. Their prayer was, May the merciful God enter the holy place and accept with favor the offering of the people. Their prayers were heard. Because Gabriel shows up. Imagine that, God showing up in the sanctuary. I wasn't expecting that. Author Annie Dillard asked, does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke in church? It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews, for the sleeping God may awake someday and take offense. Or the waking God may draw us out where we can never return. That day in the temple, the people prayed for God to enter that holy place, and God did just that. God's representative, Gabriel, entered that holy place, and he appeared to Zechariah, who was terrified. Apparently, he wasn't expecting that. And Gabriel says what just about every messenger of God always says, don't be afraid. But Gabriel was about to draw Zechariah out to a place beyond his wildest imagination, Your prayer has been heard, Zechariah. Elizabeth is going to have a baby boy. You'll name him John. He's going to change the world. Now at this point, Zechariah moves from fear to wonder. How will I know? Now he could have said much worse. He could have said, I wasn't expecting that. He could have said, you got to be kidding me. But all he said was, how will I know? Well, it's going to be pretty obvious in a few months, Zeke. Um, But apparently Gabriel doesn't like the questioning, doesn't like his wondering. And so this preacher loses his voice for the holiday season. Now that would be answered prayer for some folks. No sermons in church for nine months. The choir is laughing really loudly to that one. We could definitely beat the Methodist out of church and we'll get to Morrison's before they do. Poor Zechariah, he, he loses his voice just for wondering, how will I know? But I want to give Zechariah some credit. It's clear that he does respond in faith to Gabriel's announcement. 
that his prayers have been heard. He acts in response to the promise. We know this because about nine months later, John is born. Suffice to say, he was not immaculately conceived. Zechariah and Elizabeth dared to believe that it could happen. They dared to believe their prayers had been heard. They respond to the promise. They act, and John is born. And he prepares the way for the Messiah who would follow, and the world would be forever changed. Prayers heard, promises made, actions taken, prayers answered. What prayers do you bring with you to the sanctuary this morning? Perhaps your loved ones are closest to your hearts this morning. Prayers for aging parents or struggling children or a strained relationship or a friend battling illness. Or perhaps like Elizabeth and Zechariah, you hold an unmet hope in your heart that's been there for years. Perhaps your prayers are for our city, for healing from the divisions that have been laid bare for the world to see in recent months. It seems that things are getting back to normal, but I wonder if that's the most faithful response. Perhaps you're praying for transformation of our city that we might become a place of opportunity for all, where a child born in poverty has a better chance of success in Charlotte than in any other city in the nation, as opposed to the worst chance, which is true now. Perhaps you are praying that we might embrace these challenges and show what a city like Charlotte, with a combination of compassion and commerce and a strong faith community, can accomplish. Perhaps your prayers are for our state, that we might get a governor, or for our nation in the wake of a divisive election, for wisdom for our elected officials, or perhaps prayers for our world where war continues to shatter too many regions, Syria, the Ukraine, countless others. As we begin this season of Advent, our prayer as a community of faith is a simple one. We'll say it every Sunday for the next month. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. What would it mean for us to hear a messenger of God, an angelos, Say, this day, your prayer has been heard. With Zechariah, we might ask, how will I know? And that would be a fair question. But my question is, how would we respond? How would we live if we really believed our prayers were heard? and that Jesus is coming? How would it change what we do this Advent season? Where, where would we seek the Lord? The scriptures call us to see him in the least of these, in the hungry and the thirsty, the stranger, the poor, the sick, the prisoner. John the Baptist will have a word to offer later in Luke to those who are preparing for the Lord. What should we do? They ask. He calls them to repent. And when they ask him how, you remember what he says. Let those who have two coats give to those who have none. And those with food do likewise. Perhaps it's like that bumper sticker that reads, Jesus is coming. Look busy. which is to say, get busy with the work of the kingdom. 
doing justice, loving kindness, walking humbly with God. Prayers heard, promises made, action taken, prayers answered. Come, Lord Jesus. This is our Advent prayer. What would it mean to live in the faith that our prayers have been heard. Amen.